Well, uh, thanks, Craig, for this introduction. Thanks to Terrapin for the invitation to speak here. That's a great honor and pleasure. And uh, yeah, as Craig mentioned, uh, what we do as a business, among other things, is looking at potential for retailers and FMCG suppliers in emerging markets. And uh, Africa has um, begun to appear on the radar screens of European and US multiples. And I'm going to look at Africa as a growth opportunity not just for retailers, but also for FMCG suppliers, and not just for Africans, but also for European and US businesses. So, uh, uh, looking at the uh, market first, uh, um, from a uh, global perspective, yes, yeah, Sub-Sahara is the second most a dynamically growing region in the world now after Southeast Asia um, achieves quite impressive growth rates, but it's coming from a low level. So um, in Sub-Sahara, average incomes are almost 40 times lower than in the US. Uh, South Africa, the most developed and uh, 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 most um, uh, modern uh, retail landscape here, obviously, with incomes um, 4.5 times higher than in, in the rest of Sub-Sahara. Um, uh, compared with the BRICS market, South Africa takes an interesting middle spot, and with well over 50 million inhabitants, that makes it an interesting market for global players. Um, the population size and the growth of the population, um, they suggest enormous long-term potential. By 2050, the population of Sub-Sahara is likely to double. That is something qu you know, quite amazing. Um, uh, but a uh, long term really is the only perspective for retailers, especially as they are hit by uh, um, problems in the US and Europe, um, and, and that refers to the global multiples. So, uh, uh, and, and, and the next point I'm going to look at is how retail modernization really is being driven by a growing population in Sub-Sahara, uh, by higher productivity and incomes, although we need to be careful about the term of middle class, so uh, something that businesses in Europe are only beginning to understand that um, middle class is a very relative term. So, uh, for example, in Europe, a middle class household would be a household with annual income of 30,000 euros, and in China, that'll be 2,000, in India, that'll be 1,000, in Sub-Sahara, that'll probably be um, less than that, depending on, on the area we're looking at. So middle class is not all the same. So as a retailer, you wonder, am I going to put a 20 million hypermarket investment in the middle of a country where, you know, consumer spending needs some time to, to uh, grow? And, and, but, but, you know, the reason why Africa is beginning um, to look interesting for European and U.S. businesses, and that is going to impact the uh, South African FMCG landscape, uh, is the desperate search for growth that's um, happening. And I'm going to tell you uh, where this comes from. First, a, a quick look at consumer spending levels. South Africa, higher levels than China and India, less than Russia and Brazil. That itself makes it... Uh, uh, an interesting place for uh, um, global suppliers. The retail market is pretty small as a result of the low um, per capita levels. So the US retail segment is still six times lower than Sub-Sahara, but the fact that Sub-Sahara has the almost three times higher population really shows where the long-term opportunities lie. And again, investment in emerging markets for European and US businesses is always long-term, is always strategic. Um, in the last 25 years, or in the 25 years to 2018, uh, consumer spending in uh, Sub-Sahara will grow more by, by factor of seven and more. And that's the result of um, population growing by 80% and consumer spending uh, quadrupling. Um, those are interesting figures. Again, they are coming from a low level, but Europeans are beginning to notice. And if we compare the population growth rates we see in Sub-Sahara compared with the rest of the world, so in the European Union, there'll be less than 7% population growth in 25 years. So there's no population growth in Europe. Um, population in Russia is actually decreasing. Uh, the US will be, uh, you know, look a bit better, partly as a result of immigration policies. China, um, you know, as Philip mentioned, they're probably slowly um, having to say goodbye to the one-child policy, but until further no no notice, it's in place. Uh, Chinese growth will um, suffer in the long term from the demographic factor. Um, so uh, the population growth we're seeing in Sub-Sahara is um, very attractive, and that combines with a high urbanization rate, of course, that brings, brings with it new lifestyles. Here's a, the yellow curve showing how Sub-Sahara um, outperforms many regions in the world, all regions apart from Southeast Asia, uh, in terms of dynamics. Um, and, and here's the urbanization chart, and we see um, the urbanization rate in Sub-Sahara going from 10% to almost 60% in a century. And that may sound like a long time, but from a retailer's perspective, if you build a supermarket somewhere or a hypermarket, you expect it to be trading for 30, 40, 50 years. So that's actually very rapid change.
and, and, and here's a quick view uh, from a satellite of urbanization hotspots that we see in Africa. And um, of course, uh, as you all know, um, from a, a global perspective, um, Sub-Sahara outside South Africa is mainly a market of cities rather than countries. So while Angola um, may look pretty small here, Luanda is actually a very um, high potential market. But the main urbanization spots are here in South Africa and they are in the oil rich uh, um, uh, um, coast around um, Nigeria. And Kenya is an important market, of course. But, you know, retail is a sector that um, is a symbiotic, symb symbiotic industry that really grows on uh, infrastructure. And the modernization of retail really depends on the modernization of infrastructure. For example, you cannot open 1,000 stores in India, as Indian supermarket chains tend to announce year after year, uh, unless you have the logistics infrastructure and the suppliers that are going to fill your shelves. Uh, and infrastructure is an issue in Africa. Infrastructure makes retail investment difficult for Europeans in this region, and infrastructure really needs to be um, uh, un uh, seen as a very broad term. It's not just about the roads that you think of immediately, but it's also the um, supplier networks that we've mentioned, and outside South Africa there are big, you know, uh, uh, um, there's a lot of um, catch-up development to do. Um, the public administration is very important and the regulatory framework um, um, corruption is a key word here, but also inefficiency of administration that makes it very difficult for retailers to enter Africa. Um, energy provision, I think um, there's an average of 200 electricity blackouts in Nigeria to this day. I know from shopping center developers in South Africa that energy supply continues to be an issue. So lots of investment to um, uh, catch up with. Communication networks are important. European and US retailers would want to communicate efficiently with their suppliers and service providers. Um, and that only works on modern communication networks, which you may have in South Africa, but which are you know, being in the process of uh, 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 building elsewhere in Sub-Sahara. Social um, systems and healthcare are very important. Um, so without the slightest element of cynicism, this is important in terms of uh, workforce productivity, which will be a you know, key factor for European and US retailers looking to enter Africa. Financial services are important to make um, transactions efficient between retailers and suppliers. And the, uh, 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 and, and the educational system, of course, which again is to do with um, um, growth potential with um, 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 productivity. Uh, uh, looking at all the factors together from a European and US perspective, um, these are the markets that are looking most interesting to the guys there at this point in time. Uh, and that's in this order, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Angola. Angola will mainly be um, Luanda. And uh, 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 those sub-Saharan markets outside South Africa will be even more interesting to um, the European and US people as, um, now, as we've heard from Philip, uh, the growth outlook for South Africa is very moderate, um, you know, as unemployment remains high and um, uh, private debt also uh, weighs on growth. So um, the private household debt as a share of um, GDP is much higher than in Germany, for example, in South Africa. That's um, at around 140% of annual household income. That is a massive lot. That is something that really um, is going to now take time to consolidate. It's not as high as in the crisis disaster market in uh, Northern Europe, uh, Southern Europe and the US, where debt levels are around the 200%, but that is a burden on growth. So the other sub-Saharan markets are uh, becoming an important part of the growth story. Here's a quick look at the unemployment rate. Spain and Greece are the worst examples, uh, are really the disaster markets in Europe in terms of unemployment. South Africa is just at that level. Of course, a formal unemployment rate of 24, 25% doesn't mean those people are economically inactive. But again, this shows how important urban space outside South Africa is for any growth story that US and European uh, businesses will be looking for. There's a lot to do in terms of retail modernization. So in the UK and uh, Germany, for example, we can assume that far or a bit more than 90% of the retail sector has been modernized already, um, has gone into um, efficiently operated modern structures. In Brazil, we're at 40%, in Russia, 34%. Uh, in South Africa is a bit difficult to estimate because the informal sector is still so big. We, we think that probably 60% um, of food retail sales in South Africa take place in the formal segment. In Sub-Sahara as a region, um, excluding South Africa, that'll be 13%. So in theory, there's a lot of space for development, but are 
European and US companies going to take those opportunities? Um, that is the question. I think they're not going to do this. Yes, there's a growth um, outlook, uh, uh, a weak growth outlook uh, for both regions, and uh, uh, companies based there need to desperately um, look for look at emerging markets, especially if they're publicly listed. They are damned to growth. Um, so they're looking at um, Southeast Asia, Latin America. Yes, they're looking at Africa. But um, uh, expansion into emerging markets is often very expensive. The typical European retailer will need seven, eight, nine, ten years to break even uh, in an emerging market. So that's an uh, expensive investment usually. It only makes sense if it um, achieves a certain size. So you need to be able to afford um, expansion into emerging markets. And that's not currently the case for most European and U.S. players. So uh, um, Walmart is probably the exception because they're sitting on that very huge pile of cash, uh, cash but e e even they are growing much more slowly than orig originally announced. They have a really small market share in uh, South African food retailing. So uh, um, yeah, that's going to take time. Um, uh, and, and, and the point I'm going to make is the fact that uh, Western retailers from the U.S. and Europe are unlikely to enter Africa in the medium term. Uh, uh, that is creating growth opportunities for African businesses. So um, here's what's happening in uh, the EU and uh, the US birth rates have come down by 40% uh, in the half, last half century. And again, if we think at how long a hypermarket is expected to trade, that is massive. Uh, that, that is massively fast. Uh, it essentially says that um, societies in Europe and the US have changed completely uh, during the life cycle of one hypermarket. And uh, uh, birth rates um, have come down. The same is happening on, in Africa, but on a much higher level. And what this means is uh, that societies are aging. Uh, it means that households are getting smaller. And, and, and this aging of the society essentially means that um, there will be less money for everyone. It's a very simple calculation. So at the moment, probably half of the European population is part of the workforce. Yeah? And in uh, 50 years' time, uh, just one third of the population will be part of the workforce. So today we have half of the population sustaining the other half of Europe. Uh, in 50 years' time, we'll have one third of the population in Europe sustaining non the non working remaining two thirds of the population. And that'll mean high taxes, that'll mean high um, social contribution and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, medical insurance contributions, that'll mean uh, very low pensions. Uh, and, and it's beginning to make itself felt already. In Germany, for example, widely regarded as the powerhouse economy of Europe, the um, spending power, the real spending power of pensioners has fallen by 10% over the last 10 years. And that's only the beginning of the development. So what we're looking at is um, a region uh, where everyone has less money and where households are smaller. And, uh, and, and, and the combination of being a small household and having uh, less money means that um, people will um, live in residential space more often, in smaller flats with no storage room, car ownership rates will be lower, and you know the small household size, all, all of that will make um, the idea of doing big weekly, sh weekly shopping trips to hypermarkets fairly redundant. And um, the European guys are seeing this with the hypermarkets, like for like sales at Carrefour, at Tesco, at Real of Metro Group in Germany are a bloody disaster. And um, they're beginning to understand the retailers. They are restructuring their store portfolios on large scale. They're stopping investment in hypermarkets. They're competing for space in residential areas. They're really looking at billions worth of write-offs in, in, in their property uh, uh, portfolios. And that is going to cost them a lot of money. That is going to keep them busy. That's where the investment is going. So it's not going into um, for an expansion into Africa, for example. Um, here's an example of Carrefour. The red markets are the markets Carrefour has withdrawn from in recent years. And um, um, Ahold is another example from, from the Netherlands. They've withdrawn from all of Asia and all of Latin America. Um, and here's a little example of Metro Group in Germany. They've cancelled some market entries. They've withdrawn from other markets. And the big trend is very clear. It's about fixing the home market operations that are going to need a lot of investment and that often account for half of group sales still. So, and, and, and this means, you know, there's a bit of you know, investment budget left for foreign markets expansion, but at the moment this is going to China, China, China. Then there's a bit of um, Latin America and, and, you know, with some wonderful 
emerging cities such as Bogota or Caracas, Santiago, etc. There are some real retail investment hotspots in Latin America, but on the whole, most of the investment is now being done, uh, being used to fix the home market operations. So we cannot see any of the global major retailers entering Africa in the medium term, especially as most of them are hypermarkets specialists, and, and Africa probably as a continent isn't ready for hundreds of new hypermarkets put there by, by the likes of Tesco and Carrefour. So this creates opportunities for growth for South African players. And I think that's a fairly big window of opportunity that people have now. A similar situation to Russia, perhaps, where you know, the biggest store expansion programs are now taking place uh, from uh, domestic retailers that no one even knew about 10 years ago. X5 is the market leader in Russia. Magnet, a neighbor store operator with tens of thousands of stores in the country, is going to, to overtake X5 as the market leader this year. Um, uh, um, we've seen you know, similar uh, developments in China, where some of the biggest players are you know, domestic businesses that no one has ever heard of in Europe. And, and uh, uh, I think much of the retail modernization we're going to see in Africa is going to be driven or can be driven by uh, local companies, but they need to um, take this opportunity. Um, ShopRite, Pick and Pay, Woolworths, uh, MarSmart, those names are all very um, well known in uh, Europe. But I think there's also a big opportunity for independence in the informal sector. We believe informal trade in Sub-Sahara is still a growth sector. It is growing more slowly than modern retailing, which means it loses market share and it's being er eroded very slowly. But I, uh, we think um, the informal trade in Sub-Sahara is actually a growth segment still, and it's going to be, to be around for decades. It's going to be a very central part of African retailing for a long time. So as a supplier, can you afford not to have Spaza distribution? And then outside uh, um, South Africa, of course, there are some uh, very well-known uh, uh, um, retailers. Um, that will have their own windows of opportunities. So there's uh, Uchumi, we listened to Jonathan this morning, there's Nakumat, there's Tuskies in Kenya, there's Nosu Super in Angola, there's Choppies in Botswana. Uh, all of these people will be able to um, expand without the competition of Western multiples uh, for quite some time. So what does it mean for suppliers? <coughs> um, trade modernization is a three-generation project because the modernization of retail and to turn around an economy and make it efficient, um, that also needs a change of mentality with people, and that is a very slow change. You know, uh, um, old, old ways of working, of looking at life, etc., they tend to stick like concrete in, in the heads of people. We see this in Europe, where um, um, 20 years after the end of communism and 20 years after the Iron Wall came down 20 years after the beginning of democratic and market economic reform, um, the transformation process isn't even half th halfway through uh, because uh, people need to learn different lifestyles. Um, <clears throat> so the modernization of retailing, um, as I mentioned earlier, is, uh, um, needs to uh, um, uh, um, rely on modern players that battle it out with the informal sector. Um, Walmart, as I mentioned, yes, is in Africa now because they're in a very special position with um, lots of investment opportunities, but even they are going to grow uh, pretty slowly and are not going to, yes, they have triggered some investment in the supply chains of competitors. They have been a good incentive for retailers to tackle um, operative e efficiencies, but they're not changing the market in a big bang effect. They're, they're um, contributing to that very slowly. Uh, um, so uh, um, growth opportunities for suppliers tend to be in a fast growing population and in urbanizing population that um, uh, um, acquires new lifestyles, new habits. Um, and, 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 and one thing I would like to mention is uh, um, there will be growth opportunities for suppliers in South Africa to export into um, emerging markets elsewhere in the world because uh, one thing that is clear is that um, FMCG suppliers from Europe and US are not going to sit there and see their markets uh, uh, breaking down and, you, you know, um, um, I, I just um, need to explain quickly that the uh, decline of the hypermarket in Europe means the potential death for thousands of suppliers because in a hypermarket um, there's um, shelf space for um, 80,000, 90,000 SKUs, but as retailing in Europe moves to central locations, to neighborhood stores, to supermarkets, um, we are probably looking at a uh, you know, at capacities for, for 20,000 SKUs. So that means that within 50 years in Europe, uh, the suppliers of 
up to 70,000 SKUs that are available today could be redundant unless they find growth opportunities elsewhere. And of course, they are looking at opportunities in emerging markets. And that's, um, especially from the supplier perspective, that's not just um, China and Latin America, but that is going to be Africa as well. Um, so this means on the supplier base, and as European manufacturers uh, um, are beginning to work on strategies on sparse distribution, uh, which means they're probably going to you know, battle for very high market shares, as this happens, as the pressure increases on supplies in South Africa, um, export opportunities elsewhere will become uh, uh, important. So um, we know that you know, the likes of Nestlé and Unilever, they are all very active in Africa already, with, I believe, over 30 factories each. Uh, um, most of the um, Fortune um, top 500 companies have been operating in Africa for at least 10 years, etc. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight is the potential of private label uh, um, that um, European manufacturers are identifying uh, because, um, if you don't mind me saying so, I think by global standards, um, private label isn't very competitive at this point in time in South Africa. You know, it, it tends to be you know, near supplier quality, often tends to come from the same suppliers. Price points need to be very similar. But in um, Europe, private label, where you have you know, dedicated private specialists, that means a brand quality at half the price or one third of the price. And I think that's an opportunity that um, the European guys are looking at at this moment. So um, growth opportunities abroad will be very important. And there are plenty of them. Um, so uh, um, all of them have a very good um, long-term outlook and the short-term may be difficult, but then we had heard lots of interesting things about um, entrepreneurial risk-taking this morning. So Brazil, for example, will crash through the 200 million inhabitants uh, barrier very soon, and 90% of the population live in that urban space along the Atlantic coast. And uh, uh, um, retailing is only beginning to modernize. So um, the top five multiples in Brazil, the likes of Walmart, Carrefour, Casino, um, um, they are all there, but the top five together take a combined market share of less than 10% of the market. So there are plenty of opportunities for suppliers to, to uh, um, get listings in medium-sized regional uh, uh, supermarket chains. There are hundreds of them in the country. Um, yes, the market is very protectionist at the moment. That makes it very difficult to enter Brazil. So import duties double the price of a product, and then the, the retailers who are after very high margins tend to double the price again. So a cheese that is, uh, you know, one euro in Germany will usually be four euros in Brazil. Um, the market isn't very competitive, but it is going to open up, and and, and plenty of opportunities will. Uh, become available there. Then there's China, of course. Yes, China has a demographic problem, as Philip pointed out, but I think much of the growth and retail opportunities that are coming up now come from a process of urbanization, and this urbanization process doesn't really care about um, low birth rates. Uh, um, I, I think more than 60% of China's population live in urban space now. Today, there are 81 cities in China with more than a million inhabitants. In just 15 years' time, it's going to be um, over 220 cities. That is amazing growth. And those new cities, they get new infrastructure. They need new supermarkets. They need suppliers that fill the shelves of, the shelves of, of, of those supermarkets. And I think China is an opportunity that has been neglected for too long. Yes, we've all heard about Beijing and Shanghai, etc. But um, hands up, who has heard of Chongqing? Wow, one. Excellent. Um, yeah, Chongqing is a, a city in China with 28 million inhabitants. And, and yeah, what European suppliers have a presence there? Hardly anyone. Those are massive opportunities. Then <clears throat> India, of course, 93% of India's food retailing are still taking place in the informal sector. <clears throat> and that's a result of um, corruption, of weak investment in infrastructure, uh, of, of, of poverty, really, the Indian government hasn't made its, ha hasn't done its homework for too long. Uh, but the population growth dynamics suggests that um, India has a massive opportunity to become the world's number one investment story in 30 years' time. And th in 30 years' time is when the demographic factor will probably kill off um, dynamic growth in China. So, so I think my theory is that, um, from a global perspective, China is the um, investment story number one in the FMCG industry right now. Um, that'll be followed by China in 25 to 30 years. And after that, Africa has a chance of becoming the next um, uh, very big global investment story. So um, 
India is in the process of forming supermarket chains in cities, again in cities you know, that no one in Europe and the US has ever heard of, and probably the same is true for South Africa. Um, um, then uh, looking at Russia, it's a bit of a difficult market in a way, because Russia as a state has fallen back in a, um, uh, how do I say, uh, um, arbitrary and, and arbitrary and authoritarian police state pattern where um, investment is very difficult and, and corruption you know, takes place you know, all over. But uh, Russia, again, you know, has so many growth opportunities to offer for suppliers from all over the world. All over the world. There's X5, the market leader. There's Magnit, the retail I mentioned, with tens of thousands of stores that really are spread all over the country. Magnit is a retailer that hardly anyone has heard of in the West. Um, there are regional players coming up in the 12 cities that Russia has with over a million inhabitants. Uh, many of these, those cities are only beginning to form modern supermarket chains. I think in five of the 12 million strong cities in Russia, in five of those cities, there's less than 10 uh, modern supermarkets at that moment. So those opportunities are worth watching as um, pressure for suppliers in Africa is going to increase as the Europeans and Americans are going to move in over the next um, years. So, um, yeah, to sum it all up, really, um, uh, Sub-Sahara is very attractive to Europeans and US people because it grows so dynamically, but it's coming from a low level. Um, uh, Sub-Saharan cities outside South Africa, the likes of Maputo, Luanda, Lagos, uh, uh, Nairobi, they, they are becoming increasingly interesting as the South African economy is losing a bit of steam. So it'll always be South Africa plus a number of uh, uh, emerging uh, uh, um, cities elsewhere in Sub-Sahara for European and US suppliers. Foreign retailers are not going to enter over the next few years. I, I, I would almost bet on that. Um, and this gives room and great opportunities to local players uh, to develop and take market share. Um, and, and, and the independent trade is going to um, stay around for decades and it's not going to disappear soon. What Europeans and US people long used to think was, uh, for example, when the wall came down in Eastern Europe, uh, was that well, we're just waiting for Metro and Walmart and Carrefour and Tesco to enter, and then we're going to get a listing there and grow with them. Uh, uh, that strategy has failed, and um, the development potential of emerging markets, which remain emerging markets after all, um, was uh, overestimated. And uh, definitely, this strategy is not going to work in Africa. So, uh, and, and you know, with the informal trade accounting for over 90% of grocery sales in most sub-Saharan markets outside South Africa, uh, can suppliers afford not to tackle those? Because they're going to around, be, be around for four decades, really. Um, and, and, and then, as pressure increases in Africa, I think um, it's always worth for um, African suppliers to look for um, growth opportunities elsewhere. And I think the world is full of them. And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>